All right, so um, we did talk about integrated, integrated rate loss. We talked about half-life. Uh, so that now brings us to uh, collision theory. <clears throat> so collision theory, there's, there's no surprise to you guys that uh, atoms, molecules, ions, they, <clears throat> they all collide before they react. All right. They all collide before they react with each other, uh, but there's a kind of a few things to note <clears throat> regarding as to how they collide, the, the rate at which they collide, the orientation at which they collide, how much energy ha they have when they collide. So the rate of reaction, <clears throat> that's clear. They, my, my students know my writing. We're good. Uh, my, God. my wife's complaint, she's looking at my writing, she says it's chicken scratch, but you guys get it. You guys get it. So it's no, it's fine. Uh, <clears throat> so the rate of reaction is proportional to the reactant collisions. And that kind of makes sense. The, how fast we make the product is directly related as to uh, how fast <clears throat> um, the reactants collide, right? So the rate of reaction is proportional to the rate of collisions, right? And I should put reactant collisions. The rate of reactant collisions. <clears throat> so we can say uh, reaction rate is proportional to the number of collisions collisions of atoms, molecules, ions over some amount of time, right? Uh, now, the second, second thing we have to worry about is when these um, species, when all of these atoms, molecules, ions, when they collide, they have to collide at a certain orientation, right? So we'll say that the reactant, the reacting, the reacting species must, oh, let me rewrite that one. That one, it was chicken scratch. Must collide in an orientation. In an orientation that allows <clears throat> Um, contact to create a bond, right? If it's not oriented the right way, and I will give you some examples. I'll show you some examples and draw some stuff out for you uh, because we'll notice that the, it, if it's not oriented correctly, it's not going to create a bond. Uh, and then three is the collision has to occur <clears throat> with adequate energy so adequate energy so we'll say so the valence electrons can bond Right? So we have to have enough energy that those valence electrons, those valence electrons on the outermost shell can bond. So <clears throat> let's take a look at, at, a, at a reaction and, and, and kind of understand what's going on here. Right. So uh, if we take carbon monoxide gas plus some oxygen gas, well, we know that we get carbon dioxide gas. Uh, let's do a quick balance. Two, two. All right. So we're balanced now. <clears throat> now, if we take uh, carbon monoxide, uh, plus some oxygen,
and we need two of these. We're going to get two. And eventually I'm going to stop putting in these. I don't think I'm going to put these, uh, the rest of these electrons in for the uh, for the Lewis structures. I'm just going to go with the bonds, and, and you guys should understand that there's, there's our lone pair electrons out there. <clears throat> but I'm, I only wrote them for this example. I'm not going to do them for the rest. So when we look at these reactants, uh, we go to, to rule number two that we just kind of talked about, right? The reacting species must collide in an orientation that allows contact to create a bond. So there's two ways that this can orient, right? We can have carbon monoxide. Let me put this in a different. We can have carbon monoxide come in and then we can have some oxygen come in. <clears throat> but when they when they're oriented this way, well, uh, oxygen isn't really going to bond with another oxygen like this. So it, it's oriented the wrong way. So what happens here is we're not going to see a reaction if they're oriented this way. Right? Uh, but if we spin things around a little bit and we say, all right, well, here's – and now if we bring in some uh, oxygen gas, right, when these collide – when these collide, uh, I'm going to draw it down here a little bit. So I'm just going to draw this little arrow here. Wrong way. All right. <clears throat> when they collide, we get something like this. So now that they've collided, well, the product ends up being less, plus this loose oxygen over here, right? This bond gets severed right here, uh, and we get some carbon dioxide, plus we get some oxygen. Right, plus we get some oxygen. So you'll see here that that it does have. If we don't orient these, or, or when, if they're not oriented correctly, we're simply not going to get a reaction uh, to make the product that we need. Is that because carbon can only be can like it only has four bonds and then oxygen too? That's why the one on the top doesn't give us a reaction. That's why the, the, the one on the top, so, so yeah, so we need to make, um, it, it depends on, on electronegativity, right? Electronegativity says that, that this is partially negative and this is partially positive. So do you feel that these electrons around the oxygen, which are negatively charged, are they going to be attracted to this negative end or are they attracted to this positive end? To the positive? Absolutely, which means which way does the carbon monoxide have to be oriented? Yeah. Oriented this way so that these electrons can go here. Love you too. Be careful. Right? Mm -hmm. So without the right orientation, because because of these electrons, uh, you know, again, they're not going to be attracted to, to anything that's partially negative okay. as far as the oxygen is concerned. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh huh. Um, then we have uh, energy. So let's talk about energy a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to write some other stuff here. So we'll say uh, the minimum amount of energy to form a product. The minimum amount of energy to form a product during collision is what we call activation energy. Activation energy. Uh, and we use this capital E with a small a here. So that's activation uh, energy.
So for a reaction, we'll say A plus B, and we get C plus D. And I'm going to write kind of a bad graph here. So we'll say potential energy on this side. And we'll say time uh, on this side down here. All right, <clears throat> so let me draw this out here. So we'll say, uh, we'll start here. We kind of go up and then we come back down and we'll flatten out right about here. So we'll see this potential, and I should say put potential energy, not just potential, but this is potential energy that we that we see here. So down here, this is the energy of A plus B. Right, so that energy comes out this way. So, and and this up here, this is what we call the transition state. And if you're kind of wondering, well, what the transition state is, this right here, we can actually consider this – we can actually consider that the transition state. Right? It's not the final product. Uh, it's not the reactants because now they have a bond. Right? So, so this is kind of our transition state before we get to the product. So that, that'll be our transition state right, right here at the top of that. Right? And this is where our activation energy is. So activation energy – is the energy required to get to that transition state. And then down below down here, this is our C plus D, right? And that has a different energy itself, right? So the difference here, so this energy down here, this is change in enthalpy. So why we need to introduce change in enthalpy is that if we if we were to reverse this reaction and we were to say C plus D goes to A plus B, well, the reverse reaction, the energy for the reverse reaction requires – change in enthalpy plus activation energy, right? And that's going to be for the reverse reaction, right? And we can see it – we can just see it from the graph here. If I were to reverse the reaction, the, the energy that I'm going to need is I'm going to need the change in enthalpy plus I'm going to need that activation energy to reverse this reaction. <clears throat> what did you forget? You good? Oh. All right, love you too. So um, in order to um, combine uh, activation energy and rate, we're going to use what we call Arrhenius equa the Arrhenius equation. So Arrhenius equation. So the Arrhenius equation, we'll put some information about that, uh, not just Arrhenius equation, but uh, this is uh, – this uh, relates activation energy and the rate constant, right? So Arrhenius equation will relate activation energy – and the rate constant. And this is our Arrhenius equation here. Uh, it is the rate constant is equal to A, and then we have this fancy E. Let me try and make this fancy E a little better. This is the one on your calculator, that fancy E here. Negative activation energy over the gas constant and temperature. Okay, uh, so we'll kind of go over each one of these. So, so K, we obviously know K to be the rate constant. 
and e is also a constant. So this is a constant. This is in your guy in your in, in your calculator that you use, right? Uh, you'll see this fancy e that looks like this. Uh, it, it's it's a constant. Um, I, I believe it. This it's named after Euler. Uh, I think it's E R. I don't think it's A R. So this is uh, Euler's constant, um, but but we have used this before. It's not, e, this E is nothing unfamiliar, right? Uh, but if we're going to give it a name, we we just it's just Euler's constant E, uh, and then it's like. 2.718 something. I, I don't even remember all the values there, uh, but it is a, a constant value. And then we have R, which is our gas constant. Uh, we use 8.314 uh, joules per mole. Uh, so that'll be our gas constant, and T is temperature in. Kelvin, the so temperature in Kelvin. And A, A is what we're going to consider to be a, a pre-exponential factor. I'm going to write that down, and I'll, I'm kind of trying to explain it the best I can. Um, a pre-exponential factor. And we can kind of think about this. Let's see if I can come up with it. Uh, so think of it as think of it as as frequency and probability of the collisions, right? So we know the ions are colliding and are the, the molecules are colliding, uh, <clears throat> the uh, atoms are colliding, and A is the frequency and the probability of those collisions. So let me just write that down here. So we'll uh, I'll say. Uh, think of A. That a little nicer. Yeah, absolutely, sweetie. Think of A uh, as frequency and probability of collisions, but the fancy term is pre-exponential factor, right? Uh, but just think of it as, as frequency and, and probability uh, of our collisions. So when we're, when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at activation energy, um, and not not potential energy now because because this graph up here this was potential energy versus time and we kind of have an understanding of the reaction so we're we're just going to deal with with just the activation energy for right now which is a, a different type of graph so here we're going to have um, we'll say this is the number of molecules or the number of ions, uh, or the number of atoms, right? And we'll put kinetic energy down here. <clears throat> so that, uh, let's see, I'm gonna use, oh, we'll start with just one here. So let me just put one down. All right, so when we're looking at uh, activation energy and we're looking at a graph like this, is that here, this is where we find, uh, and I'll, let me write two of these here. This is lower activation energy and this is higher. activation energy. I know it seems a little bit odd, like, oh, why would it be higher and lower if, if this one is, is up here and that one's down here? Alex, you're reversed, or, you know, maybe you need some more sleep, right? No, th this is this is how, how it is, right? So uh, if we're looking at a graph of the number of molecules versus the kinetic energy, our lower activation energy, we're going to see um, 
as higher up here, right, versus down here. Now, uh, activation energy, activation energy has a slower rate and a lower rate constant <clears throat> active energy has a low rate constant um, so and, and to understand this and I'll put um, so that the larger the larger the activation energy the smaller uh, and this this comes from uh, and I'll write it up here let me see it is um, fancy e activation oh did I put negative up here I did didn't I yeah I did good right so the larger this value is the smaller this value is right the larger that activation energy the smaller this value is going to be and just the opposite here um, oh and you know what let me give you some more information here these are from my notes here uh, so this reflects the smaller fraction of molecules with energy um, with, oh, let's just say with enough energy with enough energy to react, with enough energy to react. Let me put a second, um, let me put a second one uh, over here. Should we do that in a different graph? Uh, no, I guess we can put it in the same graph here. Uh, so let me draw another value up here. And this time we'll say, um, No, I probably should. Let me let me put in a different graph here. Right. So if we're looking at two points here, we'll take a look at this point, we'll take a look at this point. Um, and these activation energies. <clears throat> um, is that the one with the lower activation energy, right? And let's let's remember activation energy here for a minute here, right? Um, the lower we can get the activation energy, the faster that reaction is going to take place, right? The lower the react the, that reaction energy, the the faster it's going to take place, right? <clears throat> So when we're looking at graphs uh, like this, uh, is that we say that that activation energy uh, has a slow rate and a lower rate constant. So the larger this E, the larger this E, because remember, this is high, this is low, right? 
the larger the AE, the smaller this is and the slower rate this is. So this, the one with the higher Wrong end over here. This one, I, I just did the wrong one. I'll do it in red still. Right? This here, if we're looking at it, has a higher activation energy, a larger activation energy, the slower the, the rate. So this is going to be slower than this one over here. Right, <clears throat> because it has a higher activation energy, a larger activation energy, and then the reverse, you know, seems to to stand. So the smaller the activation energy, the larger this value is. Right, and let's take a look at our Henius equation here. When we're looking at those, uh, the larger this value is the larger the rate constant is. And the larger the rate constant is, the faster that reaction occurs. So looking at this graph here, right, is that we want a low activation energy. Low activation energy means a larger, means that this is going to be larger, right? This is going to be, makes this larger. Uh, and the slower the rate, the larger this activation energy, the smaller this is. And then we go back to our Henius equation. Uh, if this is small, it's going to make this small, the, constant, the rate constant small, uh, smaller constant, rate constant equals a slower reaction. <clears throat> oh, let's take a look here. What is up next? Uh, another, oh, let me open the book up real quick. Collision there, I should have had the book open already. Okay, so just another formula um, that we're going to be taking a look at uh, is this formula here. So we say the ln of k is equal to negative activation energy over the gas constant times 1 over t plus natural log of a. And again, this this can be graphed, right? So we can determine activation energy um, by graphing some information, right? Because again, this ends up being y equals m x plus b, right? Is that here? We can plot one over t. We can plot ln over right the the natural log of k. And we can come out with uh, some kind of, of plot here uh, for that. So you're going to be given, um, I think in the, in the homework, you're, you're going to be given these values. You're going to have to make a couple graphs in the homework, which isn't a big deal. Uh, they're going to provide you the tables. You make those graphs. And, you know, the graphs will be, uh, you know, natural log of K uh, versus... 1 over t. And the slope here, they kind of want to take a look at the slope. So our slope is equal to negative activation energy over r, right? And that's going to equal our slope. Uh, so in order to calculate activation energy, well, activation energy is equal to uh, negative slope 
times r, right? Now the slope, right? You guys should all, this is just algebra. You guys should know how to calculate slope, right? Our slope is, uh, and I'll just, I'll write it here as a reminder, right? Change in y over change in x, y2 minus y1 equals, or over uh, x2 minus x1. You guys should know that. Um, and what this comes down to is, is our, our change in i, y change in x values. So it simply is just change in the natural log of k over change in 1 over t. Right. And that would get 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 if if you had to calculate the the slope, right? But <clears throat> once you make that graph, right? Once you make a graph, you can easily calculate that activation energy, right? Because the activation energy is the slope uh, times r. Oop, I didn't put times r there, did I? the slope times r. So activation energy can be graphed or activation to be calculated, determined from a graph, right? That's not difficult work. I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, calculate that. I, I think you guys are able to, to calculate that given, given a table. And let me see if there are some, some uh, tables. Oh, uh, let's see, what page is that on? 927. Oh, let's look down below here. Right. Here's a table here. Right. If you're given this, you guys know how to do one over one divided by T. Right, one divided by 555, one divided by 575. If you're doing, they give you the k value. So if you're given this this uh, table here, uh, I have no doubt that you guys can calculate one over t and the natural log of k. Right, uh, that's that's not really chemistry. That's just a, a little bit of math. And then once you have those values, uh, I'm sure that you guys can plot that out in a graph to make the graph. And then you can simply just calculate the slope. And, and again, that's just simply uh, algebra. Uh, your homework is going to have you guys do that. You'll come up with that. And then again, here it is, right? There's your slope. And you guys will calculate that out. Uh, not, not too difficult there. So I don't believe that I'm going to be calculating that. Uh, but there is another way to do it without graphing. This is this is what I want you guys to to. This is why I want to show you. I want to skip the graphing part because uh, anybody you know taking algebra can can make that graph. So uh, we're just going to use a quick and dirty method. So uh, here is the quick and the quick and dirty method. So the quick and dirty method is is we just use this formula here. We say activation energy is equal to negative rate constant times, we'll say, natural log of K2 minus natural log of K1 over 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. So using this method, uh, we don't have to make a graph. We're just going to get these uh, two different points here uh, for uh, the rate constant, two different points for uh, temperature, uh, and we can simply just calculate it this way. So let's try let's try working on one here. <clears throat> uh, we'll say. Um, the rate of decomposition, the rate of 
decomposition um, of this reaction here. We'll say um, N2O5 going to NO plus some oxygen. And we have to balance this. So we're going to go. All right, so we have this balanced reaction here. And then we'll say uh, in gas phase, <clears throat> the rate of decomposition of this reaction in the gas phase is 1.66 liters per mole per second at 600 and 50 Kelvin, and it's 7.39 liters per mole per second at 700 Kelvin. All right, well, we can simply just use these two points. All right, we can simply just use these two points and we're going to use this formula here. So let's get it started here. We'll say uh, activation energy equals negative 8.314. Uh, this is going to be make joules per mole per Kelvin. Joules per mole per Kelvin. And then we're going to take this and we're going to say that's going to be with the natural log of 7.39 minus the natural log of 1.66 over 1 over 700 Kelvin minus 1 over 650 Kelvin. All right, <clears throat> let's take a look at our units. Uh, Kelvin is going to cancel Kelvin, and I will have activation energy in joules per mole. And if anybody's wondering, I don't have units in the natural log here that I'm subtracting. All right. Uh, if if you if you remember your rules for log and natural log, is that this here also represents natural log of 7.39. And if we put the values in here, liters per mole per second, natural log 1.66 liters per mole per second, right? What happens to the units here? Right, so that's why it's unitless. This this natural log 7.39 divided by natural log 1.66 is equal to natural log 7.39 minus natural log of 1.66. Okay, and you'll see that those units cancel out. So um, that's why there's no units. If and if anybody's questioning what happened to those units, I didn't put them in. I didn't put them in because they simply just cancel out. All right, uh, it, has anybody calculated this yet? Uh, let's do let's do it in a couple steps here. Uh, we'll say activation energy equals negative 8.314 joules per mole uh, times uh, natural log 7.39 minus natural log 1.66 divided by 1 over 700 minus 1 over 7 at 1.6. 4.93 over negative 8. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and finish this, and we'll say 
activation energy equals uh, one, one, two. I'm just going to round that to 113 uh, joules per ball. All right. So that's our activation energy. And, and again, this is just uh, using this particular formula, right? Uh, instead of instead of graphing this out, uh, graphing this out, coming up with some points, uh, we'll just use the two points that they give us. So um, all these all these reactions, if we go back to, uh, does anybody need this? I don't know if, if you guys are writing down. You got if I can scroll away from this. I don't know if everybody has it or not. Does anybody still need it or can I scroll up? You can scroll up. If we go back to one of these this one of these reactions here that we talked about earlier, and we're talking about orientation. And we oriented this and this is this was our product. Our product was the carbon dioxide, but we still had this one atom of oxygen, right? And that's not what we see in the reaction um, up here, right? The reaction says we have two carbon monoxide plus some oxygen, we get two CO2 plus. It doesn't mention anything about the extra oxygen here. So this is where we're going to get into, we're, this is going to be your introduction to reaction mechanisms, right? So reaction mechanisms. Reaction mechanisms um, really start to uh, reinforce um, what you guys already know about reactions, right? And it's kind of your, this is just kind of an intro um, into reaction mechanisms. Um, for those of you moving on to organic chemistry, um, is that you really start spending a lot more time with reaction mechanisms, right? So this is kind of your intro to reaction mechanisms, uh, and then you get a lot more of this in organic chemistry. So think of reaction mechanisms, uh, kind of, uh, we'll just think of it as a reaction path, okay? So <clears throat> if we have this uh, uh, reaction here, we'll just start with simply just some, some ozone and ozone decomposing into oxygen gas plus this oxygen. Um, and then we'll, say, we'll just say this is kind of be step one here. And step two, because, because reactions are, are multi-step, right? Reactions are multi-step, but we just don't ever see it. We just, we give you a reaction or we give you some reactants, you put it together and you balance it out and then that's the reaction. We've never really looked at it uh, in this manner. So then uh, the next reaction would, would be this O plus some uh, ozone. And this would give us some oxygen gas, but it'd give us two molecules here. So this is the path here, and I'm going to highlight a couple things here. So this oxygen that we see here, this oxygen are what we consider intermediates, right? This is what we're going to consider an intermediate. And intermediates are produced in one step and consumed in another step. Right? So an intermediate is produced in one step 
and here it is. We can see that it's produced in this step, and it's consumed in this step, right? Produced in one step uh, and consumed uh, in another step. Uh, and then this gives us, because they're intermediates, and we've done this before, is that because it's an intermediate, right, we don't really need them in the reaction, right, uh, is that we can add this up together, and this is nothing unfamiliar that we've done, uh, but here we get 2O3 plus we get 3, oh, not plus, we get 3O2. But we have a little bit better understanding of, of how, this, uh, how this works. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a few different um, reaction mechanisms. Uh, so initially, we have what's called a unimolecular reaction. A uni unimolecular reaction involves one reactant, right? We have A going and, de you know, turning into some product or products, okay? Unimolecular reaction involves simply just one reactant. And we can have a rate law for that. So uh, our rate law for this would equal, uh, you know, K times that concentration of A. And that's kind of what we just saw right now with the ozone, right? We have uh, ozone here, gas going to O2 gas, plus this oxygen, right? So we can say, um, you know, the rate is equal to K times, you know, ozone, and we have some rate here. And don't forget the definition of rate, right? Like what, how we find rate, right? Rate is some concentration of ozone over uh, some amount of some change in time, right? And that that would equal. Um, uh, K over ozone here. Um, but again, uh, we're just kind of learning this and, and uh, understanding what's going on here. So uh, unimolecular reaction simply just involves one reactant. <sighs> then we have uh, bimolecular reactions. Right. So a bimolecular reaction, as, as you can guess, bimolecular reaction <coughs> involves two reactants. Instead of one, now we have two. That we can have, uh, you know, A plus B, and we're going to get some products from that. Right. Uh, it can even be something as A plus A, and we're going to get some products from that. And you guys might be looking A A plus A. Like, how do you get an A plus A? Um, right. It's simply just two A. It, it's it's not really um, two A. You know that here. Right. This is oxygen, and this is oxygen. If we reverse that reaction. Right, we would have you know a plus a plus a, right? Um, let's see here. Um, let's actually look at one here, uh, just so we can see what's going on here. Yeah, the bi the 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 term molecular and the bimolecular. Uh, Let's take a look here. We'll use this example here. Uh, 
All right, so here we have a bimolecular reaction. I have two reactants um, that I'm dealing with. So if I were to actually draw this out, I'm going to, I'm going to draw, you know, the, some Lewis structures here, and we'll say this is uh, nitrogen um, dioxide, plus we're going to have some carbon monoxide. But we need to uh, we need to kind of go to a transition state first. So I'm just going to kind of write this down here in our, our transition. When these two collide, we end up with something like this. Let's go one bond. We end up with something like this, right? And then from here. Right, we can break that bond, and and that's where we get our NO. Plus, we're going to get some CO2. So, and and again, we can kind of consider this to be our our transition state. Okay, uh, let's do. Term molecular. Uh, so term molecular doesn't really um, mean that we have three reactants. Uh, term molecular, we can consider a reaction like this. So term molecular, we can consider a reaction uh, like this, where you have three moles of reactants. Right? Uh, and when we do this, uh, let's see. Yeah, this balance. Um, we can even, and it doesn't necessarily need to be oxygen, uh, is that we can do the same thing here. We can say uh, 2NO uh, plus some Cl2, and we're going to get 2NOC, um, 2NOCl2 there, 2 oxygens, 2 oxygen. now we're good. Okay, I just want to make sure it was balanced as all. So when we're looking at this, let's take a look at the, the bottom one here, uh, where we're going to have some, um, where should I put the oxygen? I'll put the oxygen over here because it's more, it's partially positive. So with that, well, then we'll put plus some Cl, right? And what are we going to get from that. Uh, what, what we get from this is once we put those together, we get oxygen, nitrogen to Cl bonded to another Cl. And uh, let's keep going with this because we, we need to get uh, 2NOCl. So if we take another step here, I'm just going to continue down from here, uh, is that we're going to get O, N, C, L, and we get this plus C, L here. Um, but we don't, and, and I'm going to kind of show you the rest of this mechanism here, right? Uh, because we don't want just a plus C, L. This, this here, this is what we consider just a radical because, because we don't ever just see Cl by itself, right? We see Cl as a diatomic. It's always, you know, chlorine, you know, Br2, F2, O2, N2, uh, you know, Cl2, I2. So this is what we consider a radical. We can't just, radicals are short-lived. They don't last very long. So we actually are just going to continue with this. And if we bring in another, um, Right. If we bring in another one, we're just going to kind of continue the reaction here, and we get from that here, right? Where does this fall? Let's see. We have uh, two. So here's one. 
two, right? Here's one, here's two, right? So we didn't, we didn't, you know, introduce any other, we just kept using what we have here uh, in order to come out with this, but it does match our balanced uh, formula here. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to do anything like that on the exam. So, so you know, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to do uh, anything like that. Uh, this is just going to kind of an understanding of, of what's going on with these mechanisms, with these uh, multi-step uh, mechanisms in here. Um, yeah. How can we use chloride as the radical? What was that? I'm, I'm confused in the second reaction. So I'm going to point to something. So here, mm -hmm. why do we use? Okay, be, because this is what we're going to call a, a radical. Mm -hmm. And again, radicals are, are very unstable atoms. Mm -hmm. They're unstable atoms. They're, they're absolutely short-lived, and they need to find something to bond with. Okay. Right? So because we have two of these, right, one of the chlorine has already bonded to one of them. Right. And, and that's that's going to be so we've already we've already accounted for for one of these. Mm -hmm. We do have to make another one. So where do we get it? We're going to use the other. It's going to see this nitrogen monoxide here, this NO. And it's mm -hmm. going to attack it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's going to attack it and we end up with a second NOCL. Because this this CL by itself just can't it just can't exist by itself. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we can even go back to one of our other ones that are that are unfinished. Right. <clears throat> that we we had this up here. Right. Re this would be this would be considered a radical, because we don't ever see oxygen by itself like this. That oxygen is looking for something else. So it finds ozone and it breaks ozone up into just some oxygen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we, we're going to look. We're going to look at uh, a couple more of these. So, um, uh, but this is just kind of an introduction uh, into these mechanisms. Okay, it's just an introduction into these mechanisms and trying to understand them. So does does that even help answer your question here regarding this radical? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. So let's take a look at what we're going to consider. We're going to consider now uh, reaction mechanisms and rate laws. So reaction mechanisms and rate laws in multi-step reactions. Right. So <clears throat> some mechanisms um, have uh, these steps here. Some steps are faster than others, right? Some are slower than others. Uh, sometimes it depends on temperature. Sometimes it depends on concentration. Uh, that if we take a look at this reaction here, if we take a look at this reaction here, uh, we can um, increase the rate or decrease the rate of the nitrogen dioxide, right? Uh, is that above 225 degrees Celsius, uh, it's a second order reaction that the rate here, and I'm talking about overall rate, so our overall rate uh, is K, and we'll put NO2, times CO, each one of them is first order. Uh, the overall rate is second order. And this is above 225 degrees Celsius. But below 
225 degrees Celsius. Uh, the rate is just dependent on the concentration of NO2 second order, uh, independent from any concentration of carbon monoxide. So temperature plays a role uh, in these rates, right? Uh, above or, or you know, um, raising the temperature or lowering the temperature. And then again, you know, a, a, again, we, we have different um, rates, what we call uh, slow or fast. So let's see, more reactions to go over 905. All right, so not, not too much more to go over. I think we'll probably end up uh, cutting this a little bit uh, short today. So I'm going to try and slow it down here a bit because we are going to need to understand this um, pretty well. So, and I don't want to overload you guys. So let's determine the overall rate um, from a multi-step uh, mechanism. All right, so here we're going to put chlorine plus some ozone. We're going to get ClO gas plus some oxygen gas. And then we're going to get ClO gas, some oxygen gas, plus some O2 gas. Okay. So here, this is what we're going to call step one. Uh, this is what we're going to call step two. And the rate constant for this reaction, so we can, because we, because this is multi-step, right, uh, is that this is what we're going to consider a uh, rate constant K1, K sub 1 for the first step, right? And then we would just follow this with, this is going to be rate constant K sub 2. So if rate constant K sub 1, rate constant K sub 2. We're here. We're looking at these here, right? So this is going to be K sub 1. This is going to be K sub 2. And if we were looking at the reverse reaction, is that we would actually consider this to be K sub minus 1, right? The reverse reaction, K sub minus 2. Right, so minus two are just re reverse reactions that we're going to see here. But we have to determine an overall rate, right? So it's going to be something similar to what we've already seen. Uh, let's see, we did one earlier here, right? Where we're here, we have these two steps, and then we have what's considered an, an overall step. All right, so let's take uh, the first step here. And we have chlorine plus some O3, right? And what is this going to give us? This is going to give us chlorine bonded to, I'm not going to draw out the um, Lewis structures anymore. I, I don't think we need to do that. Uh, so here I'm just going to, right? So if we bond those two together, we're going to get ClO3. And then from that, we get ClO plus some O2. Um, if we take the next step, we have, uh, what is it, ClO plus O. We're going to get ClO bonded to O. And we get Cl plus O2. All right. So again, um, when we're looking at these, so here, this, these are not intermediates, right? What are these called? Let's just, just a reminder here. 
right? That's our transition state. So those are the transition states. But if we're looking at both of these reactions, those are intermediates, right? And what's an intermediate? It's produced in one step, consumed in the next step, right? An intermediate produced in one step, consumed in another step. Um, what else? So here, uh, we can actually cancel those out, and we can also... Uh, you know what? Let me let me do not use that one. Let me put uh, this pencil here. We don't use intermediates in a rate law, right? No intermediate. I'm going to write that down for you guys. So uh, no intermediates or I might have put bystanders. or bystanders in the rate law, right? <clears throat> that here, this is a bystander, this is a bystander. So the overall rate here The overall rate here would be O3 plus O, and we get 2 O2. Uh, let's see, our rate for K1 uh, in the no intermediates. Oh, I think I wrote this wrong. Here, let's. Yeah. No intermediates in the rate law. There we go. The overall reaction. The overall reaction does not use the uh, bystanders. Sorry about that. Uh, but for our rate law, we just don't put the intermediates in the rate law. So here, uh, we're going to have. Actually, I shouldn't have even done the overall rate law. Let me, let me, let me. Let's write the rate for this one. So we'll put rate, I'll put it up here. The rate one for K sub one is Oh, there it is. And this is going to be rate sub two. K2, uh, this is, is going to be uh, because we don't use the intermediates, right? So no intermediates in the rate law, right? No intermediates in the rate law. Now, if we combine those two, so rate one plus rate two, we get the overall rate. So the rate law is equal to K1, K2, CLO, nope, er, not CLO, CL.
There we go. So for the overall rate, we, we, we put those together. We, we're combining rate one plus rate two, and this gets us the overall rate. Where we see K1, K2, CL, O3, O, CL, O3, O, and that gets us our overall rate. So um, this is our overall reaction. <clears throat> and the overall reaction, right, no intermediates, no bystanders, right, because, because they simply just cancel each other out. Um, that's when we would cancel these out. And then we come out with our overall reaction. So difference between overall reaction, overall rate there. Uh, sorry about the little confusion. Uh, I would probably expect something similar to this uh, on the exam. Um, but I'm, I'm certain there's going to be a question, uh, probably a short answer question regarding uh, the, something very similar to this. Uh, it won't be this, but it will be something similar to this uh, where I'm going to have you figure out um, the uh, transition state, right? I will have you determine the transition state uh, and <clears throat> the overall rate and the overall reaction. So, uh, you know, that, and that's going to be a, a three or four part question uh, determining each of those steps, right? Uh, and I think we'll probably just end it there. I don't think we're going to go any further. Uh, I think that's enough information for today.